This episode is proudly supported by Montague, handpicked for you. So the eating experience of our plums is sweet. That's a primary driver. It's got to be sweet, but it's also got to have enough acid because the mix of acid and sugar is what is what gives fruit its flavour. And in a plum, it tends to be slightly higher acidity. And then um, a really nice, full, not dry, but juicy um, explosion of juice into your mouth as you as you bite into it. That's that's Nirvana for us in terms of plum. For more information, go to montague.com.au. Chocolate is probably the most versatile ingredient. It can pro- it's almost easily paired with anything. Um, I th- it is absolutely bananas. Every time I think I've scratched uh, part of its surface, I, I'm learning something else of what can be paired with. This is The Producers. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Basic Chocolates was founded by Krishna Rajalingam with a simple belief that every chocoholic deserves a perfect bonbon that speaks to them. After painstaking research and trial and error, he's creating some of the most stunning chocolates in Australia, and they're delicious too. I'm a belter, so (laughs) I do uh, chocolate bonbons, pralines and truffles up here in Brisbane in Queensland. Um, So I've got a small little um, commercial kitchen um, that I rent out of in in sort of the St. Lucia area, which is a private kitchen. And then I sort of uh, go in and do some pretty late nights (laughs) when it's cold in in the summer times. And then, yeah, I make this, uh, make a bunch of bonbons, truffles and pralines. And that's kind of where I started and specifically moulded bonbons um, is, is what I specialize in. I would say that I'm, I'm not the best student, but I'm a great learner. Um, and I think it's part of representative of how, um, if, you've, if anyone's seen much of my work or heard much about what I do on through um, uh, the basic chocolate sphere, I think it's, it's evident that I, I love going down that deep dive and, and I'm, I'm a knowledge seeker at the end of the day. So, um, but yeah, I did, you know, a combination of uni um, and uh, also did some retail and casual jobs just to kind of pay the bills. And I was using, at the time, I remember when I first started, it, I, I was doing retail jobs, saving up money and then taking taking a flight down to Melbourne to save a school um, where Kirsten Tibbles is, is and, and doing, um, doing uh, hands-on classes there with uh, Paul Kennedy at Save a School. So, yeah. So I, um, I think this would have been 2016 sometime, mid 2016. I like a, fr- a group, group of like my closest friends, we, we usually sometimes do the little potluck dinners and sometimes we'll, you know, everyone goes around. I think that's pretty common amongst foodies, um, and foodie friends. And so I was kind of, I was, I said, I've nominated myself to do dessert and instead of doing like a tiramisu or creme caramel, I, I, I went online and I found a bunch of recipes. Um, and then the first thing that prompted my head was uh, uh, just a lemon ganache bonbon on white chocolate. Um, and so I literally went out and went and bought some some Kovacha chocolate and then had a go at doing it and, and also failed dismally. Uh, <laughs> and it's funny, my Facebook memories actually came up showing me the disaster <laughs> my early tempering skills um and and so yeah i did that and then i just again like i said great learner um terrible student so i actually i think i remember for, for several months on leading up to that I, I started doing these crazy deep dives on the internet and i just just sort of fell in love with that and um and i think the biggest identifier was um it sort of put my mind uh, sort of at, at sort of at ease. Um, there was this kind of a level of focus that I, I didn't really realise that I had. Um, so, yeah, that's how it went. In 2016, Krishna bit the bullet and started his own business. But it didn't quite go to plan at first. The craziest one that I did was I wanted to start in... 2016 after I'd come back from my first level one saver school course 
um, which was I think in October. I saved up money for the fridge and like a couple of other things, and I realized that I needed to get my hands on stuff. And um, obviously there was a you know it's, it's a, some larger expenses in that process. And then I was like, okay, I got to get a kitchen. So I found the kitchen, um, spoke to the owners, did an inspection. They're like, okay, so it goes through as a rental space. And then I got um, obviously I had to get my food license and and in uh, you know insurance and stuff like that. So with the food license, it was really comical. I, um, I I spoke to them and told them about it, and then they were like, "This is the only time we can fit you." And it was I think two weeks out from the week leading into Christmas, so it would have been just at the start of December. And my whole goal was to try and come up with a small batch of bonbons that I could do a friends and family sale and slowly kind of do the cold, cold emails out and stuff like that before Christmas gets in. Did zero marketing, did zero <laughs> Facebook posts. There's a business acumen out the window, had no, like just went in with just pure hopes and dreams. And I think that I told them they were, they were like, okay, kitchen's fine. And because it was a, a commercial rental kitchen, so other people had been, in there so council was already aware of the space so it was a, a bit more of a quicker process to be able to get approved and, and acquire my license and i remember i'm um, uh, the lady at the time i think it was an uh, her name was melissa and she was like oh uh, when do you need this by and it was like preferably before christmas so i can make some stuff so i got approved i think on the, the my first year's food license ticked over on the 22nd of december and I raced into the kitchen with barely enough molds as well. Turned out like close to 100 boxes of bonbons with five flavors. And I remember the fifth flavor was, I don't know whether I'm allowed to swear in this, but it was effed to, to, to hell. Like it was absolutely destroyed. It was fucked. Um, temper was off. It was half of it was stuck. It was all chipped. I was like, Jesus Christ, what am I doing? Yeah. Um, and then I and then I finally put out the post I think on the twenty third or twenty fourth, and I had a hundred boxes. I'm like hell yeah, you know I sell a hundred boxes and I have some money in Christmas. This would be great. I even took time off from work, and that's like the worst time that you could take off time from work in retail. Um, and then. I sold 12 boxes. <laughs> I, had, I had three of my mates come in and buy two boxes each. Um, or they, and they were, they were at the time, they were living out like sort of north. And, um, and so they had to drive all the way down, came through, and they're like, oh, how many boxes have you sold? I'm like, you're the first guy to come pick up. <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I remember, I mean, you know, it, it, you know, and I think the, those things are, are, are really good because I think it, it reminds you that um, – passion and and uh desire for, for for your dreams sometimes is 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 not the holistic approach as well um you know you, there's there's so many elements to 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 this outside of the the things that kind of drive our passions um so something that i've kind of uh, you know learned from that and and sort of trying to been trying to implement obviously since is um you know kind of building on that business acumen and and understanding industry and um and and the people that are within it within it and the communities and stuff so which has been great so yeah in the chocolate world there are makers and there are melters or chocolatiers with krishna falling into the latter category so in my case i'm a chocolatier um so what i do is i spend all my time tempering chocolate and in some ways i guess the real term which i was trying to get at is crystallization so we're trying to um uh, use agitation and movement as well as controlling our variables in temperature um, and of course our surroundings things like humidity and whatnot in order to be able to attain that beautiful snap and shine uh, that you get from chocolate um, and so that's basically our bread and butter for all that we do um, throughout our entire vocation. So even ganaches are tempered, pralines are tempered. Um, you know, there's, there's so many layers uh, through to that, depending on what you do. Um, and in terms of chocolate and what, uh, and, and sort of your first part of your question, I'd say, uh, it's very hard to say that it's great chocolate because I, I try to stay as unbiased as possible. I love, um, 
a lot of varieties of chocolate. And at the end of the day, for me, it's about discoveries. So I can't really, it's very hard. It's like asking what your favorite band, like your favorite uh, song is or your favorite flavor combination. There's just too many to pick from, from too many different genres and, and areas. Um, so yeah, it, it, that makes it a little bit difficult um, to, to, to kind of pinpoint. But if I really had to pick... I'd say milk chocolate's my favourite, so... (laughs) Krista is very structured with his time, but it's a little different to other kitchen disciplines. Um, So, typical day, I... It's funny, I I don't really have typical days because most of the time it's structured over, like, a week's process. Um, But essentially, I I do a lot of nights and really late nights, so um, that's kind of uh, where... Uh, how like my booking times are with with the commercial kitchen so I do a lot of that and um, and what I essentially I usually do is my first day is usually me doing um, uh, I, I use some cocoa butters uh, colored cocoa butters for, for um, the external part of my my mo- like on the molds and that's kind of what everyone sees so we work backwards so what you see first is actually what we work on first versus like a cake where you've got to build your base you bake your cake then you build it up and then you decorate um i actually have to decorate first and so that also requires to be tempered um and i guess this is the one thing that most people uh, should know about you know when you're a chocolatier every element needs to be right all the way through. So if we bugger up a process at the third point or the second point, it's going to be extremely reflective of at the end result. And sometimes you won't know till you get till the end. Um, so chocolate ex- is one of those things that is extremely humbling. You could do it for 30 years and or 20 years of your life and it will still kind of zonk you out one day when you, when you thought that you've controlled all the variables because you've actually missed a step. Um, and then so day two is, is usually doing the shells of your bonbon, which is the top part. Um, and that requires time for it to crystallize and contract. And then after that, you do your fillings and then you leave that to, to, to kind of crystallize as well. And that usually takes a day because um, usually when you're doing things with your fillings, you're doing things with, um, say, ganaches. Ganaches have got things like cream and butter. So there's some water involved in that, uh, in that sort of um, composition as opposed to just plain chocolate on the shelves. So they need more time to crystallize um, when, you're, when you're working on them. So there's a, there's a lengthy process in this. It's usually like a three to four day mark before we've produced, you know, like a full bonbon. Um, sometimes there are things that are a bit shorter and simpler, like pralines. I think generally you can kind of go a bit faster so you can get about two days, to three days, and then it's all done and dusted. Um, but yeah, that's that's the way uh, my my sort of week runs but it's it's very hard to pinpoint how a typical day would run great chocolate requires precision and creative flair i've really probably been putting some more effort into my visuals (laughs) as of sort of last year i know a lot of people they'll, they'll look at it it's funny i i had this conversation with someone a while ago where I remember I posted a photo of like one of the old tablet bars, you know, which is pretty standardized, you know, it looks like any other chocolate bar. And um, and I had just some like two flicks of color on it. Like, like you know, I used a, a, a bloody paintbrush of cocoa buttered colors and just sort of flipped, it, flipped those on the mold in sort of a very abstract way. And I had... I don't know how many people commenting on the post and everyone's going, wow, this looks incredible. And I do something really sophisticated and everyone's just like, eh, whatever. So <laughs> I, was, I was at this, this weird bit where I was like, shit, what am I doing? <laughs> so so I, I started uh, thinking a bit differently um, sort of towards the end of last year. I've been sort of trying to find a lot of external sources um, of I guess, finding my style um, and things that I'm inspired from. So I'm trying to find things from music. I'm trying to find things from other art and known artists. Um, I recently just, um, funny, last year I I got given a a gift from a a close friend of mine and um, for my birthday and it was a book for the uh, Japanese artist Yayu Kasama. And so I, and, you know, the little dots and, um, 
that she does on her stuff. And I actually tried to replicate that on, I think it was 300 or 400 pieces last year. And I think at about the second mold, which which would have only been 80 pieces, I think I could feel the internal tears building up slowly because of the (laughs) required patience. Because it's a 30 mil mold that I'm sitting there trying to dot you know, and I have to leave it to, I need it to be at a very specific temperature. And when I talk about temperatures for cocoa, tempered cocoa butter, our working temperatures are between 29.5 degrees and 30.5 degrees Celsius, right? And then it sets pretty much right in front of you at 27 to 28 degrees Celsius. So when you got an AC running at 18 degrees Celsius, and that's kind of the general you know, sort of temperature, you're probably your ambient room temperatures, then probably, you know, based on the space and how big it is, I think it's, you know, 30 square meters or something like that, or um, it's not a very big space. It's it's going to end up setting in front of you in the space of, say, a minute or so, right? So while you're sitting there trying to dot something on a curved sort of half uh, you know, sort of circular mold. That's also something you need to be aware of is the viscosity of those. Is it going to trickle down and sort of end, ends up bleeding over? And then obviously then your idea is wrecked. And, you know, truck is one of those things like where if it's set in the mold, like you can't really like scrape it off and clean it off without it kind of leaving, leaving some remnants. So it's like, it's going to be very apparent when I knock it out later. So I basically have to like think about starting again or that piece is going to be a dud. Um, but the le- one of the most recent photos, which is on the Instagram, is the, the classic Yei Kasama of the, the black and the yellow of her one of her most iconic pumpkin art pieces. And that's when I drew that. And uh, yeah, that took a long <laughs> and uh, an arduous time to do that. But yeah, I, I, I've been trying to draw a lot of, different ideas from different spaces um yeah i i I got fascinated by um um i'm not i I haven't been to japan so it's going to sound really crazy that my second point of inspiration is also from japan but it had to do with the um the the stories of japan's most famous and notable samurai uh miyamoto musashi um and i was thinking about the level of precision and the amount of training um, that these individuals dedicate themselves to uh, a pure form of mastery when it comes to their duels and they're practicing all these moves. But in the end, when you look at some of those duels that these guys have had, which were arguably the most notable elements of the 1600s, notable stories of the 1600s, uh, and they become legend, you know, they're finishing the opponents in one move, but they've spent, 20 years practicing the one move do you know what i mean so there's a level of precision so i i kind of um i did an art uh, like some of the art that i did for a, a more recent piece as well um i restricted my movements of my brush strokes to only three and i wasn't allowed to take the brush out of my out of the, the little cavity uh, and so that way there was a point that every piece over i think it was like 400 pieces was the amount that i did in january per per flavor and so that means each piece would have a three brush stroke which would kind of look unison but they were all individually different if that if that makes sense so like that so that's what i mean by like trying to find very different ways to do what you know, because there, there are lots of artisanal chocolatiers in, in the world, as well as there's a few of us in Australia who are incredibly talented and know what we're doing. But we've all kind of learnt the same bits of knowledge from everywhere. So, you know, a lot of us have started out by going to, say, a William Anglais place or they've gone to Sabre School and learnt through Paul Kennedy and, and Kirsten Tibbles. And, and we've learnt the same styles of art um, in, in our vocations and we've just replicated that but we've you know created our own flavors sometimes we don't even create our own flavors we're just you know kind of using someone else's concepts and ideas and then we're just kind of going through that as a process so I I, I, I guess it wasn't just purely about trying to be different but again it's for me it's about being able to explore and discovery So if I'm confined to the same spaces as everyone else and I just follow that vocation, there's just 
this we can't really educate Australians into what makes artisanal bonbons so great and why people, you know, Europe and America is so fascinated by it and they've embraced it. And I want people here in Australia to know that, you know, just because we do some fancy art stuff that we don't actually, that we actually do dig really deep um, in terms of where we're, we're finding our inspiration and where, what sort of produce as well we're using too, which is the other bigger conversation. <laughs> One of the standout characteristics of basic chocolates is the dedication to local produce. Super blessed in this journey that I've been able to, um, you know, I, I, I know for a fact that I do come across, I, I don't admit it often, but I, I am extremely passionate about what I do and I love, I genuinely love using local produce and I, I don't use it as my band-aid for marketing, I, I genuinely um, love the interactions that I have with people. It's so wholesome, and um, when you get to meet other people in, in uh, through your vocation in different areas, you tend to understand. It kind of brings a new life and perspective to what you do. So I've had the opportunity of working with some really incredible um, people in 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 Queensland. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, like uh, I had um, a friend of a friend who I met just by chance who was like, oh, we love Krishna and his work. Um, let's get some bonbons for like an office party, right? But they insisted that I rocked up to the office party. And so um, just, to, just to say hello and g'day and introduce myself. So I get there and then halfway through the conversation, it's like, oh, you use finger limes in your in your bonbons? And I was like, yeah, when it's in season, but it's like, it's insanely costly um, and it's hard to get. And as a small um, you know, chocolate, a small sort of chocolatier that's still a one-man army, um, I can only buy, you know, maybe 300 or 400 grams, maybe even 500 grams, otherwise, you know, stuff's going to go to waste or I need to kind of give them away to friends so they can use it in their gin cocktails <laughs> instead. So... I, you know, he was like, oh, my family actually owns a, a finger lime farm and that's RMF finger limes, um, which I always forget where it is, but it's probably about two hours away from or an hour away from Toowoomba side. Um, from memory, I could be wrong. Um, and, you know, and then I was able to get, you know, fresh finger limes in season last year um, because of that. And, and I'm planning on doing it as well this year. And they were amazing. So, you know, and, and again, I'm, I'm one of those people where I like the purity of certain ingredients as well. So like a lot of, I know a lot of chocolatiers, <clears throat> if they ever get the chance to use finger limes, it's always like a freeze dried powder or something like that. And the problem with a lot of freeze dried acidic fruits, it's, it's not, it's not what it should taste like. So you get a lot of astringencies from the skins um, of finger limes, and then you also get a lot of that harshness of the acids because the water has been, is gone. Um, so I created a um, sort of like a gel texture. So, you know, we use things like Pat de Fouise, um, which are sort of like the, the, the sweet jellies um, that are really popular in, in, in France and in Belgium and a lot of confectionery. Um, but, by halving the, um, the the pectin amounts used, you can formulate a gel um, that's still um, going to actually hold uh, its structure when you bite into the bonbon, right? So a different texture as opposed to something a bit firmer, a bit softer um, and quite uh, liquid and, and still bursty, if that makes sense. So I came up with a gel and I started to realize that certain pH levels in the gel, because you need, um, there are, it's a yellow pectin that we use, or we call it yellow pectin, but it's a fruit based pectin often derived from like pears and apples. And so, um, it needs acid in order for it to activate so that it could set. So in that particular point, depending on your pH levels, whether it's between 3.3 to say even four ish, um, you're going to have a variance in what kind of other ingredients go in, whether they're going to oxidize or they're going to break down and so forth. So I've realized early on that finger limes needed a slightly lower, I mean, so, sorry, higher pH in that case, so closer to it being neutral in order for it to actually hold its form so that when someone bites into the bonbon, they get the actual texture and mouthfeel that you would get if you were to just bite into a few finger lime caviars. 
So I, I was really fortunate that especially sometime in March is usually when you get all the varieties of like several varieties of finger limes available. So I would kind of do this random mix bag where I would get all these different finger limes with the different species and the different colors. So you'd get all these nuances of little grapefruits. You'll get nuances of other kind of um, uh, acidic profiles and flavors. And then you put that into this kind of relatively neutral gel and then when someone bites into it, they're like, holy hell, they're getting something, again, they're getting something similar and, and, and has a point of unisense, but it's still different. Um, so that that's one uh, story just to cultivate. But this, you know, I get, it, there's so much more. Like I've had the opportunity of working with local bakeries. You know, last year I did a, um, a, a, a like a coverture. A coverture is... Um, so think of white chocolate. Um, you've got sugar, um, milk powder, um, and and cocoa butter generally is the general consensus. And then some white chocolates, they'll add, you know, vanilla and things like that. And maybe some like soy or sunflower lestin to make it a more workable um, item. And so in in this case, I, I've, uh, if you do a coverture, it still has the same properties with the same snap and shine. But what you do is instead of having the dry mass as your milk powder, you can actually take, you can actually create a coverture without having any milk powder and you can substitute that dry mass to anything else. So it's not chocolate on theory, um, but it still has all the same properties because at the end of the day, when you're trying to create that snap and shine, that's formulated from cocoa butter. It's not formulated from the cocoa solids or the sugars. So it has all the same properties. So like I went to, um, you know, Agnes uh, uh, has a uh, restaurant, has a Agnes bakery and they do that smoked potato sourdough um, that is so gooey and oh so scrumptious. Um, it's a great uh, flavor profile. And because it's wood fired, it's got this amazing nuance in terms terms of deeper smoke as well um and i dehydrate dehydrated that for for two days um and then blitz that down into a dry mass and use that as my vehicle for flavor for the shells so that i could recreate like a sophisticated pb and j bonbon krishna started by selling to friends and family but now has a successful online market so everything's online. I try and keep it easy. As a one-man army, I, it's really hard. At chop. It's one of those things where I can't really stop and start again. Like if I stop, I've basically got to start again. Um, so early on in the journey, I was trying to facilitate people coming in and and being a, a closed sort of commercial kitchen, it makes things a bit hard. So I've put everything online. I've been really fortunate to 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 learn about. Um, you know things like thermal liners for packaging and and you know uh, things like ice packs and how to pack things properly so I take a lot of effort into packing them and then um, everything is sent out via express post um, when it's um, available online and uh, believe it or not I know a lot of people have some some gripe with Australia post and sometimes there are problems but for the most part I've actually been been really fortunate for my business that um, uh, things have gone quite well with them um so yeah and um so yeah that's how i do it off the back of the online success krishna is looking into automating the ordering system to give him more time and flexibility in the kitchen um well so the big one for me this year is we're like i've been doing these sort of monthly selections on our on our page and and um, a lot of my customers get annoyed with me because I, um, <laughs> being a one-man army, I sometimes get a bit disorganized. So I'm trying to automate everything and set up, set it up as a subscription. So I'm not going to be changing anything about it per se, but it's just more to automize and make things easier for, for, for the, the customers that jump on board. Um, and then also the bigger one that I'm trying to do is I'm trying to obviously expand um, basic chocolates so that we can actually really kind of have a proper foothold um, in, in Brisbane and Queensland and hopefully of course in Australia as well and so that's my, my biggest step so there's a lot of 
planning that I'm working on at the moment behind the scenes and a lot of uh, uh, writing up and trying to figure out um, the things that I need for, for, for to really scale up and, and, and make this sustainable over a longer period of time. So that's, that's where I'm at. Basic Chocolates has been quite fulfilling, but for Krishna, it's the amazing connections with passionate foodies that has had the biggest impact on him. I'm fortunate that very early in my my life, I'm only 31 now, so I'm, I'm, I'm relatively young. I and I and I started later as well. Like I started at 27. Uh, I mean, 20. Yeah, it started at um, 2016. Sorry, so it would have been 25 or 26 years old. So like you know, when that journey kicked off, I I. I think I was still trying to figure out what I wanted to do for a long time and I couldn't really find things there. I was very keen on starting my own business, but I, I never knew what I wanted to do. Whoops. And I also didn't know what was actually going to fulfill me and give me some purpose. And that's what this gave me. Um, but also, I guess the other bigger aspects and the other bonuses that have come through is the opportunities and the type of people that I've met. I've met some insanely incredible individuals um, in, in very different vocations in different areas, people that, um, you know, like me, who are very persistent towards that sort of um, mindset towards reaching a level of mastery. Um, and I've started to meet more of those people currently in, in this more sort of recent years especially more so than ever and it's been it's been a very humbling process seeing that um and kind of learning about people in in those areas as well chocolate is probably the most versatile ingredient it can prop it's almost easily paired with anything um i it is absolutely bananas every time i think i've scratched a part of its surface I, I'm learning something else of what can be paired with and what other flavour combinations we can kind of create and go from but I think if I got to sum it up to that one thing that's that's got to be it For a small bespoke one man business Krishna has managed to garner a national audience with his dedication to creating the perfect bonbon This is The Producers, a Deep in the Weeds production. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of producers, farmers, makers, and growers, the true lifeblood of the food industry. Follow us on Instagram at Producers Podcast or email us at producerspodcast at deepintheweeds.com.au.